Good day, everyone. My name is Doug Glenn. I'm the founder and publisher of Heat Tree Today, a North American Heat Treat industry media brand. You can find out more about Heat Tree Today and our periodic podcast, Heat Treat Radio, by going to www.heattreattoday.com. I have the privilege of being your host and moderator for this next event in Seca Warwick's Heat Treatment 4.0 e-seminar. This next session is a panel discussion entitled Maintenance in the Age of Industry 4.0. To help us through this discussion are five industry experts who I would like to introduce to you now, starting with those on your screen from left to right. First is Mr. Robert Shotkovsky, and he is the director and vice president of the aftermarket segment at Seco Warwick. Mr. Shotkovsky has a master's degree in electrical engineering and in 2012 completed postgraduate studies in effective IT management in enterprises at SGH Warsaw School of Economics. Simultaneously, he also completed a one year management uh, program offered by the ICANN Institute and Harvard Business Publishing. Mr. Shotkovsky has been with Seco Warwick for over 24 years, where he held multiple positions, including electrical design engineer, head of electrical system design, vacuum furnace team director, global IT manager, business development manager, and most recently as vice president of the aftermarket segment. Next from the left is Dr. Pavel Morkish. He is an assistant professor on the Faculty of Applied Mathematics of AGH, a, pre a prestigious technical university in Krakow. Dr. Morkish is an expert in the field of numerical methods, stochastic analysis, optimization, and artificial intelligence. In addition to his scientific experience, he has uh, cooperated with many companies and has a, the status of NVIDIA Deep Learning Institute Ambassador. In business, he is interested in the use of advanced mathematical methods to solve real problems. Next uh, from the left, third from the left is uh, Mr. Herbert Vitsum, and he joins us from Siemens. Mr. Vitsum is a senior digitization consultant and supports Siemens customers in 21 Central and Eastern European countries. For over 10 years, Mr. Vitsum has been involved in product life cycle management, where he has helped companies in the automotive industry, aerospace industry, and the sports industry. He has also been involved with the food and beverage industry, mining, processing, chemical, and metal processing industries. Today, Mr. Vitsum spends 50% of his time working with one of Siemens global customers. And then finally, on your screen of the four sitting there is Mr. Christoph uh, Bahofsky from Sika Warwick, who has a master's of science in computer science from Zelonogora University. He specializes in industrial IT systems and has been with Sika Warwick for 11 years, where he has gained experience with many of the company's largest and most difficult projects. Also joining us uh, remotely is Mr. Robert Opletel, and he is uh, representing today the alliance between Rockwell Automation and PTC, PTC being a global software company. Mr. Opletel's experience is in the areas of augmented reality and digital twin. He works with manufacturing companies to help them protect and improve their competitiveness through the successful adoption of new ways of working. So as you can see, we have a very distinguished panel today. So let's jump in and into the topic uh, for this panel discussion, which is heat treatment equipment in the age of industry 4.0. So we'd like to address the first question to you, Mr. Uh, Shotkovsky, Robert. Uh, let's discuss, uh, uh, before we start, let's, let's discuss the first question uh, from in this way, before we start talking about modern maintenance tools related to industry 4.0, would you please lay the groundwork for the viewers by briefly recalling the history and development uh, of the maintenance concept? Okay, so uh, when you ask me for the maintenance uh, history, I would say that maintenance uh, comes together with the human and the first uh, tool. In fact, uh, 
you know, the uh, defense and combat tools uh, prepared in advance uh, was already the element of the uh, preventive. However, we are sitting here today to discuss the uh, present time, and it has to be said that uh, first, uh, really comprehensive approach to maintenance is uh, total productive maintenance. So TPM uh, was originally developed in the 70s in Japan. <clears throat> the main goal of TPM is to maximize the efficiency of the uh, 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 using the machines and equipment by optimizing the maintenance using the resources already existed in the organization. So instead of having the separate operators and the maintenance staff, uh, the people are trained to both operate and maintain machines in daily manner, and they also act as the first, let's say, support line in case of any damage. So, from this perspective, the main goals of TPN covers the, uh, no short stoppages, uh, no damage, no unplanned outages, and no accident. And generally, the TPM is supported by, uh, by eight pillars. But the, for the purpose of this meeting, let me describe the, the first three. So, the first one pillar is called autonomous maintenance. Uh, it is a very unique feature of uh, TPM, which assumes that the operators are those who, uh, due to the fact that they work every day with the machines, are the most accustomed with uh, these machines' behavior and performance, and they somehow uh, act as a guardian of the machineries. So generally, they act not only as the operator, but also as the people who really understand and maintain those units. They are also uh, requested to make, let's say, the, uh, the first and the easiest, let's say, uh, repairs for in case of any failure. Uh, the second pillar, which is called uh, uh, plant maintenance, uh, so from the assumption where, the, let's say, the first pillar is about, let's say, protection, the machine against the unexpected and short stoppages, all those, let's say, uh, maintenances which require highly qualified staff uh, needs to be planned in advance. And um, the target of such a, let's say, thing is to minimize the uh, outages of the uh, equipment, so the increase the efficiency and the availability, uh, and also to maximize the utility or use the, this highly qualified uh, staff. The third pillar uh, of uh, TPM is uh, uh, quality management. So from this perspective, the people are trained, but also encouraged to verify in a daily manner all the problems which could be related to the production, which may eventually lead to the general problem with the production and the quality. And uh, as you can see, uh, all those three pillars show a very strong relationship between the machines and the operator. So from the assumption, the human plays a fundamental role in the TPM, and the skills of these humans are gained over years through the continuous uh, training program and uh, completed uh, experience. Right. Right. Yeah, very good. So, they, so let's jump over to Dr. Morkish, if we could. So Robert just mentioned this, this pre prediction being a very much a human factor. But as he said, it takes a lot of time and a lot of experience for equipment operators to acquire that knowledge and the expertise to properly maintain their equipment, keep the equipment up and running. It, with Industry 4.0, how is, how is this changing? How's this changing? So let, let me now give you some background here because we are experiencing a large boom of AI. 
But the neural networks is a very old concept. It's more than 70 years old right now. So what really happened? What's, what's the change, right? So let me now jump on, on a very different topic on computer vision and the story that I will give us a good parallel on what's happening right now to the maintenance and uh, Internet of Things and the industrial Internet of Things. So there is a famous competition in computer vision that's called ImageNet. It's about uh, classifying an, an image by an algorithm. So bef before the 2012, the computer vision experts were working on it. So they were trying to find um, the tools that will classify an image. So how does it work in practice? There was a picture and the algorithm was about to classify whether this is a cat, and a dog, or an orange, or whatever there. And in 2012, mm -hmm. a guy that has no computer vision background came, uh, he was Alex Krzyzewski, and he managed to uh, employ a new technique of, of deep neural networks. It's actually the first success of deep neural networks. Uh, it's called AlexNet, and he managed to decrease the error that was previously obtained by the computer vision experts of 25% to 15%. So practically, he reduced the mistakes from every fourth image to into every, every sixth image. And how did that happen? So he managed to do that because of three factors. The new type of algorithms was, of course, one of the things that he, he did. Second thing was that he had enough data to feed the algorithm and to train the network. And thirdly, it was finally the time when the hardware enabled him to do that. So that means that uh, all those three factors happened and we could see uh, here good breakthrough. Since that, the, there's very active research based on that. It's more than 68,000 papers, scientific papers, that are citing the original AlexNet paper. So we are talking about literally tens of thousands of years of research that is put into this field. So why am, why am I telling this? Because we are talking about uh, maintenance here. The parallel is like that, that for us for computer vision, no expert knowledge was required to train a very good model. It's, it's similar for, for maintenance or for industry that we can use the hundreds of billions of records to train some model instead of putting all the expert knowledge there manually. So this is the way to automate some processes. So uh, now let, let me talk about those three factors, right? First was the data, big data. So as I said, um, there's a lot of data that is produced by Internet of Things. And uh, it's said that by the end of 2022, uh, the industry will produce more data than all the other sources combined. And taking into account the policies of multiple companies, such as Facebook, that are collecting every single click of every, every single user, this might, be, this might be surprising, that it's the industry that will be producing more data than all the other, all the other sources. The, se the second thing is that with this data, uh, it's impossible for a human operator to, to look at all the sensors. If you have two sensors to look at, you can look at it. If you have five, maybe. Ten, not, not really. But if you have a thousand, there's absolutely no way to do any, anything manually to that. So you need to employ some novel techniques. Even the, the standard statistical tools let you just have a look on one, two, or maybe ten at once. But if you wish to, to look at multiple sensors at the same time, you need deep learning, you need something, something better. So what is this deep learning? Uh, th this is a completely new way of training. So the, pro the, the previously used neural networks were around two hidden layers big, and you try to optimize the whole network at the same time. Right now we are talking about networks that have thousands of, uh, of hidden layers, and how do you train it? You train it in a process that is similar to how you teach a child. You show an example and you reinforce it. So in a very big picture view, you're trying just to change those of the billions of parameters that were responsible for your network to give you the wrong answer. So you're practically saying, OK, you were wrong here. This is not an apple, it is an orange. But uh, this is changing just the, the set, that, just the parameters that gave the wrong answer. So you improve the, the models by, by the time that's happening. So as I mentioned, the whole boom of AI is the consequence of simultaneous occurrence of those three factors. And enough data, new types of algorithms, and the hardware that lets you do that. Great, great. So, Mr. Vitsum, I'd like to uh, pose a question to you, if I could. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that all of our viewers, all of our viewers, I'm sure, have heard of Industry 4.0 and the Internet of Things. But would you please take a minute and tell us basically what's behind it? What's the 
what's behind the Internet of Things? Okay, thank you for the question. I, I really like it, I have to say. So think about the, the, the Internet of, in the history, the last 30 years. It was like Internet for humans. So one human would exchange data with another human, be it by email or chat or even uh, talk, to, um, talk to a server for reading news and so on. But now, with the advance of technology, we are able to put technology into things. So what kind of things I'm talking about? I talk about the machine, a sensor, a car, even a soccer ball, whatever you, you can think of, name it. And then you put in some electronics, and you use internet technology, which is available very cheap these days. Then you would use like Wi-Fi or mobile communications or in the future 5G or Ethernet, whatever. Then you add software to that. And with that software, you can make it intelligent. So now you have an intelligent device, whatever kind of device it is. It's just a thing, right? And then you make it communicate with another thing. And this thing's using internet technology to communicate with each other. It can be in the local network, it can be in your house, it can be in your factory, but it can even be like connecting up to the cloud or connecting up to your vendor if you buy a machine from somebody. And what kind of communications would you have? I'll give you an easy example. Let's say you want to turn on your light if somebody passing by uh, a sensor. So that sensor would talk with the light, and both would be Internet of Things devices. But maybe you also have a sensor which can, can sense if how dark it is, is it outside. Do you really need the light? Then you would also connect this kind of sensor into a network, and they can talk to each other. And that's all done for very little money. So now when it comes to the, to the industry, so there's of course internet of the industrial uh, things, which is a bit different than more, but I'll give you an example for that. Um, so, like, there is a, there's a machine, let's say it's a company which is bottling, uh, like, some drinks, like, let, let's be it like uh, mineral water. And they have a machine it's called a filler, where they put every bottle on it, and it's like 30,000, 40,000 bottles per hour. And that machine is very essential for that production. So, usually, the, the companies are depending on somebody listening to the vibrations on that machine or see the vibration on the machine. But now we put a sensor in it, a very cheap one probably, uh, and using Internet of Things for communications. And then we use uh, maybe not even AI, but some analytics tools these days, maybe enough, and we understand that the vibration is out of the norm. And if the vibration goes further, the machine would break. That's a big problem to the production, of course. So maybe we use then just some alarm and some oil and we repair it, we maintain it, and we can further unproduce. So that's a very easy example for Internet of Things. We will, I will share a little bit more than, than later on, probably. Um, and yes, the cloud could help, like our MindSphere cloud uh, service would immediately allow that quite cheap sensor to connect to the cloud and there you will find an application and that, that setup is done quite easily. Uh, and by the way, these days you could even use uh, it for free for some time and for some uh, amount of, of data. So, but Internet of Things also seems to be funny, right? So, com let's things to communicate seems to be funny. Use the data and analyze the data seems to be funny as well. But it also needs to provide a benefits to your operations. This is where it really makes sense. So, we will focus on Internet of Things, which really makes sense to the industry and to the users and to the benefit of the company. Great, great. So, so uh, you mentioned in that in your answer, which was very good, thank you, is that the use of sensors, which of course is key. So, a question over to uh, Mr. Uh, Vahovsky. Uh, can you tell us basically what are some of the more common sensors used in the in the heat treat world today? Yeah, uh, sensors in the context of uh, maintenance uh, can be divided into let's say two simple categories: sensors already included in the control system and uh, additional sensors. Just simple. Uh, sensors included in the control system uh, are nothing but the ones known to us, uh, thermocouples, uh, pressure sensors, uh, vacuum gauges, uh, dew point sensors, all this uh, stuff uh, needed for normal operation of the machine. I think no one is surprised by the sensors mentioned. However, it is very interesting and valuable if we are talking about um, Industry 4.0 and the use of these sensors 
known for years uh, for other purposes. For example, Lambda probe uh, can be used to detect uh, leaks in a vacuum furnace. Or let's take, for example, um, vacuum gauge on a vacuum furnace pumping system. By analyzing the pumping time to a certain level, um, it is a predictive activity that allows us to prevent um, damage or decrease in the efficiency uh, in normal operation. Um, as a result of this analysis, we obtain uh, the information on the need to um, uh, service uh, vacuum pumps. Or let's take, uh, for example, uh, a simple temperature sensor, um, also in, in the vacuum furnace, um, instead at the outlet of uh, heat exchanger. Uh, using uh, these sensors and uh, um, analyzing uh, recorded temperature curves from, from the sensors, um, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, get uh, information about uh, possible uh, possibility of occlusion um, of the um, heat exchanger circuit uh, or uh, possible occlusion of the um, gas channel inside the heating chamber. Uh, these sensors are typical, but the usage uh, mm, of the data they produce mm, is not. Uh, as an additional sensor, we can mention, uh, mm, for example, current transformers. Uh, we measure and analyze uh, the current consumption uh, by individual actuators of the device in order to detect uh, mm, pre-emergency situations. Uh, for example, uh, measuring uh, the power consumption by vacuum pumps, uh, uh, by uh, blower motors, uh, etc. Another example is a power monitoring device uh, for measuring uh, the quality uh, of the monitoring uh, equipment. Uh, another mm, simple example is uh, analog water flow sensor. Because typically, mm, uh, adjustable binary sensors are used. But in this case, we use uh, analog uh, water flow sensor mm, to detect uh, flow patency through mm, small cross-section circuits, such as uh, diffusion pump uh, cooling circuit mm, or power filters uh, based on the reduced water flow. Uh, Another example of uh, additional system can be uh, also mentioned uh, vibro-diagnostic sensors uh, to measure vibrations on the, on the um, uh, equipment. Next example, um, let's take a carbon deposit uh, sensor, a uh, specially designed sensor and used uh, in uh, carburizing furnaces um, to detect uh, carbon uh, deposit uh, collected in the in the heating chamber uh, one thing is important uh, all these sensors are uh, typical but uh, the correct uh, use of this sensor and uh, interpretation of the data they provide uh, i think this is the key mm, element in the idea of industry 40 thank you yeah good good thank you so before we go before we address a question to mr Opletto, i'd like to return to mr shotkovsky for just a moment with this question earlier you gave us a good explanation on the history and background of maintenance uh and as you heard mr bahovsky just say sensors play a key role in industry 4.0 uh, maintenance however these sensors have existed in the past yet we never spoke about really prediction uh, why is that? And would you please expound on the different classifications of maintenance? Yes, sure. <clears throat> so generally, if we are talking about the maintenance, so uh, we may talk about the traditional uh, maintenances uh, and the modern ones. So the traditional maintenance covers the reactive maintenance and uh, preventive maintenance, very well known while the modern one, those associated with the uh, fourth industrial revolution and the Internet of Things and Industry 4.0 generally uh, covers the um, uh, uh, pre-active maintenance and uh, uh, predictive maintenance. So let me shortly describe all four so uh, to understand the differences. So generally reactive maintenance, it is uh, the idea based on the assumption that the particular element or unit 
uh, is used uh, without any maintenance until it's failed. So the, from the, let's say, you know, the uh, uh, business point of view, it could be somehow interesting strategy, especially at the very beginning when, the, let's say, this element uh, works, because you achieve the highest efficiency and the use of this machine, but it is true until it failed. After then, the cost of the reparation may exceed, in fact, the potential profit from the, from the production. So from this uh, point of view, reactive maintenance is not commonly used in the industry, but there are some areas where this, let's say, uh, strategy is fully justified and not only acceptable, even uh, accepted. So we are talking, for example, about the lighting uh, in the shop floor. Uh, the second one, traditional uh, maintenance strategy, is called uh, uh, preventive maintenance. So preventive maintenance based on the theoretical period or cycles for the parts, let's say, uh, lifetime. And then those parts are exchanged due originally to the, let's say, manual prepaid by OEM mostly. And then, let's say, the schedule of exchange are updated by the owners of the machine based on the experience or the local conditions and such a thing. So generally, uh, preventive maintenance uh, target is to prolong the equipment lifetime and to somehow minimize the risk of the, uh, uh, any failures. Then we are talking about the modern uh, maintenance uh, strategies. So the first one, which is called uh, proactive maintenance. Sometimes it's called also the condition-based maintenance. So proactive maintenance is a strategy based on the analyzing of the signals from the machines. So right now we are talking about the sensors and the signals of, uh, from those sensors. Uh, and the uh, set of parameters which are, let's say, adjusted preliminary or in advance. So because uh, such a sample was already let's say, discussed here, Let's talk about the vibration. So we can imagine that we have some kind of, let's say, motor, which normally failed if the vibration is uh, over some kind of the level. So we may, let's say, say that 50% of such a vibration generates some kind of the alert to the operator. So he somehow is, let's say, informed in advance about possible problem. But still, this is something which is set as once without any intelligence behind. And the last one, uh, maintenance strategy, exactly the newest one, the most modern and ad most advanced, it is uh, predictive maintenance. So uh, predictive maintenance takes the same data from the same sensor, like a condition base, but here we are talking about the artificial intelligence, the deep learning, the machine learning, and uh, so... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, system analyzes the data and really predict the possible problem which may occur on the machine. So, uh, compare all those, let's say, uh, strategies. So, uh, if you take about the reactive maintenance when the part already failed, or preventive maintenance where the part is exchanged independent from their actual status, or condition-based maintenance, when the part is somehow, let's say, analyzed based on preliminary set parameters, predictive maintenance really predict the condition and inform, let's say, the uh, operator about potential problems. So finally, this kind of maintenance support customer and the owner of the machines for the, for the strategy of the maintenance to minimize the um, potential problems and also to better use the parts which have to be kept on stock. Okay, great. Mr. Apoletto, let's, let's uh, jump over to you for a question, please, if we could. Let's discuss CMMS for a moment. If you wouldn't mind, what is it and where are you seeing it being used? Thanks for the question. And, um, Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. It's uh, really good to be here with you, although virtually. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, before I will you know, deep dive into this uh, very much technical topic, uh, let me say that 
You know, companies' processes should work regardless of the technology. It's just pen and paper, right? So uh, the companies uh, should use technologies to you know, maintain or improve their competitive advantage. Because as we say well, with, with BDC is that you simply cannot fly a digital airplane, right? Saying that, uh, it's absolutely clear that technologies help. And uh, one of those technologies is um, CMMS, uh, which stands for uh, Computerized uh, Maintenance or Management Maintenance Systems or software, if you wish. And it's, in fact, a broad range of technologies. And, and uh, regardless of the technologies, you, you choose to build the concept of CMMS. These technologies or this concept should be able to answer or address four critical questions. The very first question is, uh, what is going on? Uh, that's that's the question number one. What is going on in my in my company, in my factory, in my production hall? What's going on with my machines, systems, networks? Uh, it's about uh, remote monitoring and and condition uh, monitoring initiatives. Uh, it's very often called data acquisition, and it's uh, also about very very complex uh, issue or challenge of IT OT convergence. Simply putting data uh, putting data together. The question number two uh, is uh, why it is happening. Uh, so we know what is happening, so we need to also understand why. So it is all about putting plain data into a context, integration of data, synthesis of a data, and finding basically a root cause of problems and setting up the processes to, to react and setting up the processes to respond to anything what could go wrong, basically. And it's moving from basically a reactive mode to a more autonomy, kind of like a semi-autopilot mode in the company by uh, promoting the flow of the information uh, between, between uh, different sources. The third question is, if we know what's going on and why it is happening, that uh, if something goes wrong, uh, that basically how to fix it. Uh, and that's all about providing support in addressing of all those issues, challenges, errors, failures, downtimes, and and it's it's all about uh, you know the sequence of steps from training uh, staff, uh, instructing, guiding, monitoring, and controlling uh, of the people you know doing the necessary operations related to keeping the whole production uh, up and running. And it's, it's very much about the human factor, human element of, of uh, all this technical discussion. It's more like about people 4.0. If we speak about industry 4.0 in this, in this moment, it's, it's worth of to say that it's also about people 4.0. And um, we shall not forget that this, this uh, part of the, of the uh, sequence also includes um, uh, document management of, of uh, related documentation. The, the fourth uh, very fundamental question which comes uh, to the end is actually who is going to solve or fix the problem, potential problem. And it's, it's about a uh, critical decision to be made. Uh, is it going to be internal or external resources? And if it is going to be external resources, how are we going to share uh, data with our suppliers, partner, customers, without jeopardizing intellectual property and vice versa. It is all about, you know, our suppliers sharing with us the data without, you know, sharing their intellectual property and risking basically uh, their their knowledge and, and skills, right? So basically it's all about getting, you know, these three components, suppliers, machine builder and customer together, closely working, closely working and collaborating. In fact, uh, if I look at those those questions and and, and uh, concept of CMMS, it's worth to say that there is no single technology being able to solve and address all those four questions. It's uh, it's uh, basically I would say as I said, set of technologies in charge of uh, engineering validation of components, uh, monitoring and management of those components. Uh, databases, data repositories, uh, analytical engines. We heard about uh, neural uh, analytical engines. Uh, 
and as well as visualization tools needed to see the very, very complex data structures, as well as tools to maintain the whole chain of information consistent and, uh, and, uh, and managed. So speaking about the uh, set of technologies, I also have to say that there is a necessary, let's say, the, the set of companies behind that, it's kind of like an ecosystem of companies putting those technologies in, in work and making sure that the, the adopters of those technologies gain expected, expected business benefits. Let me give you a short example of that. Um, it's it's uh, from a company called Skoda Auto. It's uh, based in Czech Republic, We're close to me here. Uh, and it's part of Volkswagen Group, and it's a manufacturer of uh, cars with the, you know, I would say very well-known brands like Octavia, uh, Superb, Kodiak, and so on. And uh, these guys uh, basically implemented um, process they call internally smart maintenance right so smart maintenance already back in back in uh, 2016 and uh, you know it's it's uh, it's a it's a process of basically making sure that the their stamping line they implemented this process in is you know up and running as much as possible and they managed uh, for very first year that this project was implemented they managed to increase their productivity for three percent which doesn't look like impressive number but if we put that number into a context of one million cars being produced it's a huge amount of the uh, huge amount of the money they they uh, help to manage skoda auto to produce and it's a great example of of uh, getting together visionary internal team because it was a bottom up initiative with the with the skilled um, partner pdc partner from outside and putting together their brains they managed to implement that uh, that uh, that uh, you know solution and you know this this example is not only about technology but it's also about the expertise and skill as experience we've got already after 5 years of having this uh, such a project in place we can share with others we heard, you know, in previously that the maintenance gets um, a lot of P adjectives, like a predictive, preventive, prescriptive, uh, and so on. Uh, and based on the example from Skoda, I would say that the maintenance should, before all, be smart, uh, be effective, and be efficient. So to make sure that, you know, uh, everything is up and running, and it's all about finding the, the balance between people, processes, and technologies, to make sure the time needed to fix any kind of problem is getting compressed or shortened uh, from analysis of the problem, you know, deploying the technology and, and uh, resolving the whole problem. Because at the end, uh, as we hear from everybody, time is critical. Thanks very much. Yes, yes, time, time is money. That's right, time is critical. So, Mr. Wachowski, I've got I've got a question for you regarding uh, some tools that are being used in Industry 4.0. Seems like we've heard a lot about the importance of one of those P adjectives that Mr. Upletal was just talking about. That's predictive. Can you tell us what are some of the tools currently being used in Industry 4.0 for prediction? Okay, uh, some of the tools was uh, already mentioned by my uh, previous uh, speakers, but uh, I, will, I will try to um, explain them uh, and connect them in a little bit different way. Because uh, <coughs> as a result of uh, digitalization of uh, production processes, methods and tools uh, used uh, in industry are transformed. Mm, intelligent sensors, uh, mm, IT systems controlling processes, uh, and even work pieces uh, generate data uh, that can be processed online or offline. Uh, we need this data a lot uh, in order to mm, use uh, uh, analytical and statistic uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, so, therefore, data collection is um, at the heart of uh, prediction of Industry 4.0. One of the assumptions of Industry 4.0 is the most advanced uh, digitalization uh, possible and comprehensive use of data uh, of, uh, on the functioning of machine, obtained most often by a uh, dedicated sensor. Uh, this type of action helps to optimize uh, the work of the enterprise 
um, on many levels, um, as the information obtained can be used uh, in various contexts um, and depending on the, the demand. Among the key technologies that contribute to the implementation of uh, Industry 4.0 concept is the analysis of large data sets. It's called uh, big data. Collecting and storing large amounts of uh, data and information for analytical purposes um, has been practiced uh, for a very long time. Uh, data meaning is uh, one of the stages uh, of uh, disco knowledge discovery process. We live in the era of uh, big data, the era of uh, gathering uh, and transmitting unimaginable amounts of uh, information collected not only by, by people, but uh, more and more often by computers, cars, mm, uh, household appliances, uh, audio-video devices, uh, and uh, more or less miniaturized uh, mm, wearable electronic. Uh, in short, by all the devices connected to mm, one uh, network, uh, which form a huge ecosystem called uh, Internet of Things. And uh, it, thanks to Internet of Things and um, data collection, mm, the amount of this uh, information is uh, unimaginable large. And uh, here comes one of the greatest problems of uh, the modern information society, known as uh, DRIP, D-R-I-P, data rich, information poor. DRIP means the scarcity of information and uh, simultaneous flooding of data. Uh, it's as, uh, as a result of the fact that uh, as um, masters of uh, data collection, uh, we are not very good at uh, using it uh, in practice. But uh, another tool of uh, Industry 4.0 comes to our aid, uh, namely artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is uh, mm, uh, based on the machine learning uh, algorithms and uh, the ability to uh, predict events with a certain probability is an uh, area that can bring uh, significant savings. Uh, many companies uh, base their patterns, uh, production patterns, uh, machine working time, uh, servicing periods, uh, planned downtimes on uh, preventive methods uh, of uh, servicing machines. Uh, based on the recommendation of the machine manufacturer, or historical data and developed patterns. Uh, the basis uh, for ensuring the reliability and maximum use of the um, company's uh, production potential is a proactive approach according to which um, the root causes of uh, component failure uh, should be removed. Thank you. So this is definitely an advancing area. I think we would all agree with the, the prediction and whatnot. And I know that uh, uh, it's an area that's rapidly, rapidly advancing. Uh, Dr. Morkish, uh, if you don't mind, could you please tell us how these intelligent tools, the AI and things of that sort, how these intelligent tools are being built and by whom? Oh, sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah. So. Uh, as I said, uh, there are, we have the tools now because we have the data, we have uh, the algorithms, we have the hardware. But now let's go into some more details on how it's done. Uh, in, in, what, are, what are the building blocks here? So in modern industry 4.0, we have multiple types of data-driven models that are under the hood. So it's anomaly detection. It can be detection of failure mode or a quality drop, just the detection. It can be then the predictive maintenance, so we would like to predict some event that will happen and that is uh, unwanted. And here I you can either think about just alerts and some notification system for this, or you can think about the estimation of the remaining useful lifetime for this purpose. Uh, you can think about root cause analysis, that was already mentioned here as well. And then it was briefly mentioned, uh, just, just the, the buzzword, but I would like to give you a hint what will come next after the prediction. That is the prescriptive maintenance and even further the optimization that includes all those, the, all those that were uh, previously. So now let me uh, jump into details of each of and every of those that I mentioned to show you how do they differ and how they are connected one, one to another. So first, let's start 
start with anomaly detection. So as I mentioned, looking at multiple sensors, it's not possible manually. But we would like to have a tool that is detecting some novelties or anomalies in our process. And I don't mean just that this one sensor has never reached that level, and this is so high that this is an anomaly. That's an obvious anomaly. But we would like a tool that will find subtle anomalies. For instance, a group of sensors was always positively correlated. That means that they were always growing together. And now, in the same group, uh, almost uh, all of them are going up and one is going down. So you would like your system to tell you, hey, something like that has never happened. Or the time that, that is taken for some processes is now longer or shorter than any time before. And how do you see that? You see that by some correlations and some different uh, relations between multiple sensors. And to do that, you need uh, very uh, good tools that are deep and are able to uh, look at multiple sensors at the same time. So here comes the deep learning. But this is the unsupervised learning. You feed the data to the, uh, to the model and you would like it to automatically tell you what is an anom anomaly, what is not. The other thing is if you would like to detect something. So for instance, you would like to detect a failure mode or a quality drop. So here, is, as was mentioned, the condition-based monitoring. This is, uh, this is the detection, because you are detecting that already something is happening. So here I would like to give you a parallel. If you feel dizzy and you are sneezing, you think that tomorrow you might get sick. But this is condition-based monitoring. You already feel bad. You already have symptoms that show you that your body is not operating properly. So that's the, that's the parallel here. And you could use it for multiple things. For instance, you could uh, detect that the vibrations are higher than, uh, than normally, as was mentioned by the vibrodiagnostic condition-based monitoring system. You could detect that in your production the quality dropped. So you already see that some sensor is seeing some uh, patterns on your, on your items that you are producing that are wrong or that are not correct. So you already know that something wrong is happening. This is, of course, also part of AI and you could automate it. And sometimes it's, it's the most efficient strategy as well. But then you would like to go one step further to prediction. So the parallel about getting sick would be, OK, you were on the gym, you were all sweaty, and you go out just in shorts and t-shirts while it's windy and raining. In, in history, this type of your action succeeded in being sick in the next few days. So that is the prediction, because at that time your body is operating perfectly well, even maybe more than usual after the gym. But you know that if you do some type of actions like that, that in history it succeeded with a problem. This is precisely how we construct predictive maintenance models uh, with AI. We find some time moments when we had a problem in the history, and we mark the time before that so that the algorithm will tell you, OK, you are right now in the time before, uh, before the failure that will occur. But at this, at this very moment, everything is perfectly fine operating. And here is a lot of details that you must include. Firstly, you need to understand what is your desired ratio between false alerts and false positives, because they have very different costs in different applications. Uh, for, for, for instance, in medicine, if you, just, if you say somebody, somebody that you, you are most likely sick and he is not, you just make one more diagnostic. So that's the cost of, of false. Uh, false uh, positive, right? Yeah, the cause of false negative is you tell somebody, okay, you go home and this person gets very sick or die, and you have a big, and this is a much bigger problem. So here's the ratio between false positives and false negatives. There are a lot of applications where it's the other way around, because if you stop a machine just to check and everything was working perfectly fine, you can lose thousands or millions of, of euro. So it really depends case by case. The other thing is time horizon. What does it mean that you would like to predict a failure? In some applications, five minutes is more than enough for you to take action. You can lower the load, you can do some, uh, some things, and nothing happens. You just stabilize your system and operate them. In some systems, three days gives you nothing, because you are already all contracted, and it's, it's a, for instance, it's a big boiler that's in a power plant, and you, you cannot do anything within a few, few hours or a few minutes. Then a couple of days is, is enough, uh, is, is uh, absolutely required to take some action. It's a mid is the minimum, right? And now what to do with the models? So you can either generate model alerts and notifications. And this is one thing that is classically used for predictive maintenance. You are just telling somebody, hey, within next this prescribed time horizon, something wrong is likely to happen. And then it's the solely uh, responsibility of the operator to take some actions and to decide what to do in order to avoid the failure or minimize its uh, consequences. The other approach would be the estimation of remaining useful lifetime. And now 
let me give you here the ideal situation, how should it work. It should work like the car when you are tanking it. You are putting petrol to your car and it tells you, hey, I expect you to drive for 850 kilometers. It has no idea whether you are planning a mountain trip and you will be aggressively going up and down then it will be 300 kilometers, or if you are going to on the motorway, just set a cruise control to 110 and you can go for 1,200, right? It has no idea, but this is the best estimate it can give you at that very moment. But please also notice that the last 20 kilometers of your car is usually quite precise, right? And this is what we would like to, to achieve in this type of models, that this is telling you exactly when the problem will occur when it, you are close to that. Now, the, the story is that if you have good predictive maintenance model, you can go for root cause analysis. Right now, root cause analysis are made manually. Experts check what happened before the failure. They look at the sensors and they say, OK, this sensor changed, so this practically was that. But doing manually, you can look at a few sensors, not at a thousand ones. So what we would like to have is to have a model that is telling us, OK, the probability increased when this and this change happened. So we can backtrace what change in the process succeeded in changing uh, the, the probability of oncoming failure for the model. So having that in place, you can, you, you, you can see that. And now we can understand how to make one more step. If we know what changes succeeded in what changes of probability, because we have in place the very good uh, quality predictive maintenance model, we can think about prescriptive maintenance. Prescriptive maintenance is answering the question what to do in order to avoid a failure. So this is the next step after we have predictive maintenance, because we, we may know that uh, in some cases uh, you should just avoid this type of situation or it can tell you, okay, if the humidity is that high, that high, you should operate with this and these parameters. So this can be all automated by your AI. And then its next step, which is the future of, in my perspective, it's the future, because it's the process optimization. Because avoiding failures is not necessarily your optimal strategy always. You need to think about it, because in some cases, you just can lower your load for 90%, avoid failures forever, and this will be the optimal strategy, because the downtime is so costly, and this is just what you would like to have. And as the uh, overall profit for your company, this would be the best. But it's not difficult to imagine a situation when you increasing by 10% your productivity, you make so much profit out of it that you completely, under, that you completely accept the uh, higher probability of failures and just having twice more failures and downtimes uh, than previously, just because you are making so much money. So the point that I'm making here, because the question was who and how is doing this, it's a close collaboration between, uh, between the nomine experts and, and data scientists, because you need to understand which model would be the best to use. And I told you, yes, you can automate the building of models, but you cannot automate the information about how, wh what do you want from this model in this particular situation. This is the crucial key factor here. You need to tell the model what exactly do you want from it, and what will be the best for your business, and then you feed the data into the model, and then you have automated everything. Deep learning is, is, is learning what you tell them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marcus. That's very interesting, very interesting. So, Robert Schotkowski, question for you. Is, is predictive maintenance then a successor to total productive maintenance, or TPM that you spoke about earlier? The uh, simple answer is no, uh, absolutely not, I would say. Uh, uh, predictive maintenance cannot compete with the comprehensive maintenance. Uh, it is a tool which supports strategy for maintenance. So from this perspective, absolutely, it is a part of the, uh, all of the maintenance uh, tools. So uh, predictive maintenance um, uh, cannot um, completely uh, eliminate the traditional, let's say, uh, way how we, let's say, do maintenances. But uh, together with the new tools, new, let's say, possibilities, is support the operators and the owner of the machines to uh, the best uh, and uh, increase the efficiency use of uh, those machinery. One thing is uh, very important to understand, so uh, uh, PDM, uh, predictive maintenance, that not, does not guarantee 100% of efficiency. So we are closer and closer to that value uh, because we may better understand the machines, its uh, performances and operations, but still there is a huge, let's say, place for the typical maintenances and the prediction support operators. Okay. 
All right, thank you. So maybe maybe we can move on and address a question to our two automation company panelists, Mr. Obletel from uh, Rockwell Automation uh, PTC and Mr. Vitzdum from uh, Siemens. Uh, let's start with you, Mr. Obletel. What are big What are the big automation companies doing to prepare for these changes for in Industry 4.0? Uh, I had to so unmute up myself. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I had to unmute myself. Uh, um, I'm here representing the alliance of, of uh, uh, Rockwell and PDC and uh, those changes coming into uh, manufacturing industry um, or industries uh, are exactly the reason why we put together this partnership to, you know, the reasons to build that partnership. And um, saying that, I shall not forget our, our other technological partners like Microsoft. We use the cloud uh, platform Azure and, and Ansys. Uh, we build a digital twin with. And of course, uh, you know, companies helping us to deliver uh, on that from global system integrators on one side to uh, local companies helping, you know, companies like Seco Warwick uh, really to adopt new technologies on the local and scale it up to, to the global basis. Um, just, uh, just uh, you know, really kind of look back into a history. Uh, PDC has published its own, you know, very first article related to uh, um, industrial uh, Internet of Things back in 2014. It was November back in 2014, and it, it was called "How Smart Connected Products Are Transforming Competition." It was wrote by PDC CEO with uh, famous Michael Porter. And, um, you know, the same authors uh, published in the same magazine, actually, it was the HBR. Uh, they published this year uh, the article called uh, The uh, Augmented Reality and How We Work, uh, The New Normal. And the, I would say the delta between those two articles show, you know, the, the journey uh, the companies, or I would say entire industry, went through from 2014 to 2020. Uh, from the very initial concept of connecting products to be monitored and digital twins, helping engineers to optimize their designs based on the real-life data, uh, customer support teams having early insight into uh, challenges of their customers using their products, simply connectivity uh, between between the companies, machine builders and their products to the point uh, where uh, thanks to augmented reality, the concept of physical and digital convergence was completely adopted because today augmented reality is de facto a standard uh, companies uh, utilize by the way, because of COVID as well, and because of COVID, despite its deadly footprint, I would say COVID helped to accelerate uh, a lot of a lot of uh, positive changes, including cloud uh, adoption, augmented reality adoption, artificial intelligence. We speak about and and other technologies. We currently work with companies, um, you know, as a post-COVID, as a new normal era. We help companies to to be more resilient, and not only companies, but also their their supply chains. And uh, and uh, to be more specific, uh, honestly, uh, so let me let me name some of the latest uh, latest uh, innovations uh, we are introducing. The very first one I would say is is Project Atlas. It's uh, it's about combining. Uh, the world-leading uh, platform Vuforia for augmented reality, with the with the only uh, cloud-based CAD tool called OnShape, and this this combination of those technologies should help uh, companies and their suppliers really benefit from such called digital threat and get those guys uh, really closer closer together. The second innovation uh, I feel uh, I really feel proud of uh, because I'm part of the augmented reality team is, is uh, actually, uh, f these are features helping companies uh, really to take the augmented reality from the object level to the spatial level, uh, from object like machine to the space like a production hall. And uh, it's through a commercially available uh, features of Vuforia area targets or through uh, open source technology. It's the very first open source we released as a company. And it's, it's called Spatial Toolbox, so anybody can access it easily with no cost. 
And these company, uh, these these features help companies really interact with IT OT data in a space through augmented reality. Last but not least um, is is actually um, technology we introduced very much recently, I would say, uh, with a great support from Microsoft, and it's called Factory Insight as a service. And uh, and this this uh, set of features uh, really helps companies to adopt uh, IoT AR technologies in substantially faster faster manner. Uh, and and uh, these technologies help them really get over in easily over something what we call and what industry analysts call a pilot purgatory. So instead of just piloting different technologies, you know, put these technologies in in work and and have them you know making money for you as a as a as a company. Uh, in fact, just to just to conclude on what, what I'm saying, the the uh, the reality is that augmented reality became a mainstream for uh, remote monitoring, distance working, and uh, skills sharing and and capturing knowledge. And cloud is becoming also mainstream in even in the in the areas we would not expect that a uh, couple of years ago. It's like uh, design, engineering, and validation of of your new products. And uh, we as PTC and Rockwell, uh, with all the combination of hardware, software, we've got like um, uh, sensors, PLCs, uh, software like a CAD, PLN, IoT, AR. We believe uh, we are really in the good shape to deliver on, on those topics we discussed today and help uh, companies like Seco Warwick uh, and its customers really benefit from these amazing, amazing new technologies, which really help yeah. to drive uh, a new uh, business opportunities as well as competitiveness. Thank you. Good, good, good. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Vitsum, let's jump over to you. How about Siemens? What what are we seeing there? How is how are they preparing uh, for Industry 4.0? Yeah, thank you very much. So Industry 4.0 is a very interesting journey, and it may have started quite early. So when we acquired the first software company in 2007 for product development, uh, Unigraphic Solutions, this is where we started our journey, I would say, into digitalization, which will not be over for the next 20, 30 years. We will still be in an important journey. So automation companies has totally to reorganize themselves in order to support the requirements of the customers for digitalization. And I give some basic examples from Industry 4.0 coming from the German Industry 4.0 alliances. So first one is horizontal integration of your product development and production processes. And I will give examples soon for that. Another one is the vertical integration from ERP till the production. Then digital twins are an important new initiative and higher automation or even self-driving factories. And all the examples we did here today in this discussion panel, you see that there is a much more requirements to the factories. And you may think, oh yes, we do artificial intelligence, so we need our own new sensors, our own new network and our own new technology. No, that's not true. Still, the old automation pyramid can help you. So the automation vendors will support you with this information so that you can do the calculation. We'll support you with the network, which is, of course, industry-grade network um, being possible to be worked in even uh, dark industries, right? So um, let's give an example for horizontal integration. So maybe you want to develop a part for a car, let's say, let's some kind of metal part. You would start in a CAD construction software, and then you better simulate that kind of part if it's really doing what it should do. And how you do that in a non-integrated way, you would export, exp export that data to a neutral format, lose a lot of information. And then you will have to make a net on it, maybe with a second software. And then you go to your calculation, simulation software. Then you, you, you see, ah, here is a problem. I have to change something. And you have to tell that to the card person to do that. No, that's not integration. Integration is to do it seamlessly with the same kind of format in the same kind of software. Still, maybe you have three different or two different people with two uh, different 
expertises, but they can use the same information. And because of the integration, they will know what the latest information is so that they work with the real latest data on that. So, but this is not stopping here in the product development. It also goes over to the production development. So let's say you have to produce that part now. Now you, again, export and lose information and quality. No, you don't. You immediately move over that information into your machine to develop that part, let's say, or to your serious production. And then you get a lot of new data, maybe we call it digital twin then, or digital twin of the product, digital twin of the production equipment, and all the data is enriching the knowledge about the product. But even when you when that product is sold to a customer with the cloud connection, we still can keep that integration and know all times what's happened with the product. Of course, not without consent of the end user uh, of that product. So that's maybe horizontal integration. And we felt that this is so important that we have to buy all that companies which help us to make that possible. So that's now all products of our own company, Siemens, and not an alliance. Alliances can break, but this is the main source for our customer. We will always have to provide them ourselves. Um, let me explain a little bit the uh, vertical integration of factories. So you know that your orders are coming through your ERP system or maybe you, you, through your customer relationship management software. But how does it go to the production? Maybe by phone, by mail, by I don't know what. Uh, maybe there's a big disconnection, but here lies a lot of um, um, possibility for effectiveness. If you would know how long it takes to produce a certain product in that amount, and you could even use that in the negotiations with the customer, you can predict the very detailed information, very concrete uh, time for delivery of the product, which makes it possible that you get the contract and not your competitor. So also that vertical integration, which goes through the automation systems to the production is very important. And you have a full transparent information about the efficiency of your product and how long it takes to produce a certain product and then not. So I give you an example of what integration not is. So like my, my, pri my, my power company who is supplying power, electrical power to my house, they asked us for using a smart meter. Maybe you also ask for that, right? And then they asked me for a 15-minute value. And I thought, oh, that's a great idea. So I get an API, I can read it myself, I will have a screen in my house seeing the power consumption. Yeah, but that was not happened. I asked him, what's happened? And they said to me, yeah, we have to export and import that overnight. That's not integration. Integration means yet seamless immediately. And that's not easy done if you have to combine so many different tools and they have different development paths. So this is why I believe that automation companies uh, have to integrate everything for their customers uh, and being some kind of one-stop shopping for digitalization, which means a huge change in the organization the people, how we work together. And that's also part of my job, that I have to bring them together for one customer, which I really like to work with such incredible people. Maybe I give, an, give you a, an example for uh, self-driving uh, production. It's a, it's a big furnace, let's say. I'm not, I'm not able to name a name or even the, the industry, but it's a big furnace. And that furnace is producing some, using some terawatt uh, of electricity around the world. So there's productions around the world. There's not only one, there are many. And the goal is to reduce that power consumption. And the operators did everything in their knowledge already. And they were trained around the world, they exchanged their knowledge. But still, as we did hear before from Pavel, it's not easy for a human to, to incorporate all these parameters to optimize. So the goal is to optimize, to reduce the resource consumption, and also to redu reduce the amount of time needed for production. So what we're going to do is we bring all that together in an integrated way and include uh, also the, uh, some artificial intelligence and with the customer's experts for the process and our experts for like uh, mathematics and artificial intelligence, we can do that together. This is an example how we go much faster than before, not being only an automation company, but also being a company to support our customers. And maybe I will go, go come to an end with another example. Uh, Rastniklas in Slovenia, they said to us, look, we buy everything from you already. Can you not help us to use that system better in the way of digitalization? And yes, there is enough uh, 
uh, colleagues in my company for consulting. So we help them to set up a full digitalization strategy for the future and to combine all that together. So I believe this is where we're going to, that we become a one-stop shopping for digitalization for our customers in the industry. Thank you very, very much. Very good, very good. Thank you, thank you, appreciate that. Well, it's been very fascinating. I think there's a, a, a lot of advancing knowledge uh, a lot of things to digest uh, on a very large, a large scale. But I've got a question. Last question here. I'd like to uh, address to Mr. Bahofsky. Uh, all sounds very good. All, all seems like it's something that we could all benefit by. Can we say anything about the cost and benefits of Industry 4.0, especially here in the heat treat sector? Yeah, there are many benefits uh, of using, uh, of implementation of uh, predictive maintenance. Uh, for example, as a basis, uh, lower maintenance costs, um, reducing the number of uh, uh, downtimes, uh, extending component lifetime, uh, increasing production, of course, uh, reducing uh, the inventory of spare parts, uh, also support for decision making. Mm, and uh, also the improvement uh, to work uh, safety. Uh, about the costs, we can say that uh, we have uh, three areas. Uh, mm, the hardware, uh, I mean additional sensors uh, and uh, other equipment. Mm, second one is uh, disk space, uh, usually cloud. And third uh, is uh, the software, analytical and reporting software. The exact uh, calculations are difficult to pin down because uh, they depend on um, too many factors, mm, uh, like, uh, for example, number of devices uh, included to, um, to prediction, like uh, uh, device equipment, uh, I mean, the, the sensors uh, already installed on, on the machine, mm, the moment when the decision uh, to implement is made, Mm, and also depend on the number of uh, circuits um, included in the analysis. Uh, according to um, independent uh, expert reports, uh, the actual maintenance cost uh, can be reduced over um, 50%. This includes uh, the direct labor cost, cost of the department itself, uh, uh, as well as the cost of the spare parts and um, tools and uh, other uh, re uh, equipment required to carry out this work. Uh, by the way, we can uh, we will attach uh, the list of the reports to the conference materials. Uh, but one thing is important: uh, PDM tools are fully scalable. This means that you don't have to immediately implement PDM tools uh, for the entire plant uh, for all the devices. Uh, you can start with a uh, device of, uh, of your choice uh, and uh, critical circuit, for example. Mm, this is a remarkable advantage of this solution. Flexibility in selection, mm, depending on the actual needs and possibilities. This feature means that uh, with minimal expenditure, everyone can personally see the value of, of uh, this service. Thank you. You know, that's an that's an excellent point. I think a, a very good point to close on actually is the, is this fact that you know the Internet of Things seems to be so big, so comprehensive, and a lot of the things we've discussed seem to be a complete paradigm shift in the way we're doing maintenance. But I think Mr. Vahovsky says it well, and that is, listen, you don't you don't need to start with a complete remake, right? We can start with individual elements of your uh, production process and be able to be able to change those for the better using industry 4.0 so uh, that's a, that's a very good point thank you for that so gentlemen thank you very much for your time uh, and your expertise uh, certainly your input has been very helpful indeed I'm sure there will be a number of uh, viewers who will be interested in following up with you at some point so uh, thank you very much for for your time and, and expertise. Coming up next in this block is, uh, which is, by the way, we're in block number two, daily heat tree challenges. Two top-ranked service technicians from the United States will give you some pro tips on how to detect and eliminate vacuum leaks. Because let's face it, with a vacuum furnace, the most common problem is, in fact, a vacuum leak. 
So stay right here to get your pro tips from John Betcher and Don Martini, both from America, both from the American Office of Seco Warwick. It's been my honor to be your uh, your moderator, your host. Uh, again, my name is Doug Glenn. I'm the publisher of Heat Tree Today. Gentlemen, thank you again, and thank you everyone for watching.